I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And then we, we find that uh, the introduction of the lesson tells us that Jesus is overlooking uh, Jerusalem. And as he overlooks Jerusalem, he makes a comment that is found in Matthew 24, 2. He says, Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. So, of course, I'm guessing they will be confused like I will be confused because it, let us imagine with them. They grew up seeing the temple always there. So they cannot imagine that this temple is not going to be there. There's in the time that the temple is not going to be there. They have always seen this temple. So what does Jesus mean that this temple is going to be destroyed? Not one stone is going to re remain. And then he ties it in with the events of the end. So they want to know, when is it going to happen? Well, Jesus went on to the explanation. That's not part of what we're looking at today. But today we're just looking at where the context lies. Then the disciples are confused and so are you. What could Jesus possibly mean by these words? How do they relate to the end of the world? Last paragraph introduction. We will study Satan's twofold. Notice, he has two different ways of attacking. We will study Satan's twofold strategy, both to deceive and to destroy. So those are two key words. Satan wants to deceive us, like he deceived our forefathers in the Garden of Eden, and he wants to destroy us. What the evil one fails to accomplish through persecution, he hopes to achieve through compromise. So, if we look at the big picture, Satan has used two strategies. One, persecution. And if that did not work as effectively, then the other one was to uh, achieve compromise. And we have been compromising as Christians, unfortunately. You know, we want to be accepted. We don't want to be rejected. You know, we want to feel good. We want to, you know, be in good, good grace with people. So we will compromise a little bit here, a little bit there. And before we know it, we have compromised God's principles. And that's why individuals will say, oh, it's your rule. Uh, they will say, you know something, Eli? That's not biblical. That is your thing. That is your thing. Uh, Theodore, it, it's not about what the Bible says. It, it's you, Theodore. It, it's your rules and that's part of the compromise problem because people no longer look at the straight truth they look at the compromise God cannot be that exacting God is forgiven and they forget that there was only one disobedient act yeah. that has caused us to be here yeah. and they say I'm gonna let you talk in a minute and, and, and they say oh God God is not that exact yes God is exacting when he gives us the rules to go by and he gives us the ability to live by the rules. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand, Satan has two methods, persecution and compromise. Yeah. And the last part says, God is never caught by surprise. And even in the most challenging times, he preserves his people. My brother, you want to say something? I was concerned about the own opinion and your decision. I was asked this a couple of weeks ago, a couple of days already, about the King James Version. Mm -hmm. Now, version is somebody's opinion. Okay, go ahead. Oh, yeah, they are. So, we are following the King James Version. Because they said it was the best new version. Doesn't that mean he did a lot of rewriting and done? He gave his opinion about something. Okay. Like when somebody changed the song, they put their, their text on it, how it should be. Okay. So, uh, what was the better answer to give that person saying, well, God's not going to let his word be changed. He's going to always be fair. Okay. So, the thing that we have to recognize that when things are even in history, we have to look at the context. That's the first thing. And to say the King James Version, it just means that King James was the one that gave the authority to translate the Bible into English because it was always in Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and Latin. And people didn't read unless they were scholars, unless they had money, they were very well educated, they were able to read Greek, Hebrew, Latin, all of those but the everyday person was not previewed to those languages. And the commission that King James gave was make an accurate translation for the people to understand. So that's why today, some of the words that we find in the Bible is all English, but it was an understood word for that time. Like for example, the word wiles, W-I-L-E-S. That's not an everyday language for us here in the 21st century, but back then it was understood. 
the equivalent for WISE in the 21st century is an organized plan, systematic, to accomplish something. Mm -hmm. We do understand that in English. So if we use those words in a new translation, it, it will be understood. But we have to stick with the older translation as close as possible because the older translation stuck to the translation from the Hebrew and the Greek and Latin as close as possible. So that's what we have. Also remember, holy men of God spake as they were moved yes. by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So it's still, it's Holy Spirit is really the author. Yeah, he just worked through individuals and people. Yeah. Using even their own uh, uh, experiences, yeah. experiences and things, but it's still the word of God. And like he said, King James, is, that's why it's called the authorized by version. He authorized the committee of monkey priests to, to convert it over mm -hmm. to the common vernacular of the people. Thank you for that intervention. And fast forward a little too, with the Reformation, it was a similar situation. When the Bible was translated from the Hebrew, Latin, and Greek to German language, then the German people were able to read the Bible for the first time in German. They didn't have the problem because the, at first they could not read it because it was exclusively done by the priesthood only. Bibles were chained to the pulpit. And only those that were priests were allowed to go there, have the key, and turn the pages. So if you were not a priest, you could not have access to the Bible. So imagine now the joy when the German people got it in their German language. Yeah. Same thing English. When they got it in English, they were oh, wow, this is great. So as we look at this, we always have to remember two things. One that Elder Maurice just mentioned, that the inspiration came from God. It does not mean that God said, okay, write A, B, C, D. God inspired a person, and in their personality, they wrote what God inspired them. So if I'm a doctor, I'm going to write from a doctor's perspective, being very methodic. Like Luke says, let me give you the history of what truly what happened. Because he was a doctor. So in his profession, he was very methodic about doing things. And that's what we find. So we have to understand that when we hear about the version of the Bible, it's not just a man-made thing. It's a man instrument that wrote the Bible, but it was divinely inspired by God. Thank you for that comment and that question. Okay, so now, Sunday gives us something interesting. It says, a broken-hearted savior. What does it mean that a broken-hearted savior? Hmm. Let's see what the introduction tells us on Sunday's first paragraph. It says, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, overlooking the city of Jerusalem, his heart was broken. John's gospel says he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Now, if we put it in a bigger context, Jesus was heartbroken not only because he saw what Jerusalem did, but he was heartbroken in the context of what they did not accomplish what they could have. The Jewish people had the potential to be the greatest nation on earth, the one that had the most advanced education, the one that would have the most financial stability, and most importantly, they would be the, the carriers of truth to the rest of the world. Yeah. And Jesus, as he looks at Jerusalem, as his time is getting closer, he cries because they did not accomplish what they should have. It's just like sometimes we, we have um, friends or children or whatever it is, and say, wow, Johnny had such great potential, but look what Johnny did. Johnny just stopped right here. He dropped out of high school. He was the smartest kid from first grade all the way up. And when he got to the 11th grade, he just dropped out. But he had so much potential. What could not he have done? And it hurts because you know the person you know. So imagine now God in his love for his people, all the things that they could have accomplished. Of course, he's going to weep and cry to see that they have failed to reach that height that he wanted for them. Yes. So do you think being that we have sight and senses after he died and sacrificed for us, that he still moan and sorrowful for us because we have great positions, we have all the we have a proper access, but Jesus already died and sacrificed and made a way that we can still have all these things that we need. Like peace of mind, no worries, faith and comfort. We have all these things and the Holy Spirit that we still fail to do certain things. Do you think that he would still be mourning or feeling a certain kind of way, even though he loved us and mercy for his character? Okay, so let me try to answer it this way. 
those of you that are here present and those of you online, do you have children, adult children, yeah. between the 20s and 35? Do they always make the right decision? No. no. And when they come to you requesting your advice or something and you give it to them and they say, nah, I'm not going to do that, how do you feel about it? Disappointed. Yeah. Disappointed because you have been down that road before or you have seen yeah. somebody gone down that road before and you have an idea what the results are going to be. And when they ask you for the advice and they reject it or refuse it, you say, oh man. And you know they know better. And they know better. You know better. That's exactly how God feels about his people and more. And more. Because remember, when he created us, in what image did he create us? In his own image. So most naturally, if we miss that mark of representing who he is and what we can accomplish, he's going to be disappointed and hurt it. And moreover, knowing that Jesus, at the time as he's looking to them and seeing prophetically, his time is coming to an end, and they did not accomplish what they did. Let's look at it again. John 1.11 says, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. It can't be more disappointing than that. Next, Jesus' love for his people flowed from a heart of infinite love. He repeatedly appealed to them in love to repent and accept his gracious invitation of mercy. Let's look at some of the verses here that it's given. It says to look at Luke 19, 41 to 44, and Matthew 23, 37. Let's see what is it saying. Luke 19, 41 to 44, and Matthew 23, 37. 19, 41 to 44. Matthew 23, 37. So we have Matthew, I mean Luke, let's start with Luke. Luke 19, 41 to 44. Okay, it says here, uh, when he would come near, he held the sea and wept over it, saying, If thou hast known, even thou at least in this day, the things which belong unto thy feet, but now they are hid from thy eyes. To 44, is that it? 44. And shall lay thee even with the ground, and the children within thee. They shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein, that sold therein, and them that bought, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but ye have made it in thee. And he taught daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the rulers of his people sought to destroy him. So, don't you think he had enough to weep on? They should have been the repository or the preservers of the oracles of God. And it was so distorted to the point that what was happening in the temple? The temple was not a temple of prayer anymore. It was a temple of business. <laughs> they were buying and selling doves and whatever other animal, goat and glams and whatever it is. It was a business place. God's temple became a business place. So they went far from the mark. God's temple, as he said, the emphasis is a house of prayer means it's a house where you commune with God. You get your direction, your instruction from God. But they were not getting the instruction from God. They were like just making money. Oh, yeah. you, need, you need a lamb. Inside the church or outside the church? It's, it's, because mm -hmm. growing up, our grandparents Aunts and all other churches. The first thing they would do was sell chicken dinners, fish dinners, and all of these things out of the church. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, for whatever reason, always the building fund, or the building empty field was the building fund. But growing up, our, 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 our Baptist family members would always would sell lunches out of church mm -hmm. all the time. So wouldn't it be a. Same principle involved. Yeah. The house of God is not to make business. Right. Right. The house of God is to pray and to commune. Yeah. That's the basic thing. 
Let's look at the other one now. Uh, Matthew 23, 37. Said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that kill thy prophets and stone them which are sent unto thee, how often would I would gather thy chickens under, his, under her wings, and ye shall not, and ye would not. So this was another situation that caused him to cry. What was it that was mentioned there? Besides, the first one we found that they did the money changing and their business in the church. And this one now, there's something else, even to the extreme. What is the next situation that happens that they make Jesus weep? Killing the prophets. Killing the prophets. Absolutely, killing the prophets. They were guilty of killing the prophet as a nation. We can remember different prophets that came along. One of them, at least he was feared, that was Nathan, when he, when he confronted um, David with the sin that he committed with Bathsheba. And he gave him a little story, and then David said, how, how that person needs to, to be punished. And then Nathan said, you are the man. And he realized that he had sinned against God. The thing is that he did not go to the extreme to kill Nathan, but he recognized his sin, confessed, and repented of it. Yeah. Exception to the rule. The other prophet... Elijah. Elijah was wanted because Elijah, quote unquote, was the, the, the cause of all the problems that had happened in Israel. Elijah was the cause that it did not rain. So, unfortunately, the distortion that people have is not uncommon when satanic influence is gaining territory. Yes. As I see, as I read certain things in the Bible, I realize that God has always used people to give us warning. Mm -hmm. And from Noah's time back to today, God continues to give warnings to people, to prophets, to people that are love, that love God. And so we have to learn when to yield to these warnings that God gives. For example, we know mm -hmm. that the next warning that is coming, and He tells us what to look forward to and all of those things. So He always gives warning. Oh, yeah. To save his people. Yeah. Okay. So we find that in the warnings, it's not just a one time, it's continuous in different times, under different circumstances. Yeah. But what is the main objective that God has for that? Why would you think God is keep giving messages of turn and live, uh, repent? Why do you think God is keep doing it over the centuries? He wants to save us. He wants yeah. to save us. That's the main thing. And if we translate that into God's character, what kind of a character does God have? A character of love. Um, let me share a little bit yes, go ahead. You know, uh, White, he said, God knows that in humanity we shall find no solace of our own woe. And he pitied us because we are so needy, yet so unwilling to make him the confidence our burden bearer. He sees human beings slightly to love and mercy provide for them. And he says, sadly, ye will not come to me that they might have life. That's the thing. Sadly, our condition can be changed, but we do not use the methods that God has for yeah. our condition to change. We want to change ourselves. You know, many times we have heard in the U.S. says, no, I, I cannot go to God because I am not clean. I got to clean up myself first. I got to clean up my act. I got to do this. I got to change that. And they don't realize it's not because God doesn't want them. They cannot do it in their own strength. They cannot do it. You know, I've, I've heard individuals that, that work in the drug addiction program. They say, well, I've been clean for 10 years, sober for 10 years. Why can't they do it? You know what that person is saying directly without realizing it? That they are the measuring stick for change. They change, you can change too, yeah. because they had the ability to change so they can pass it on to you. Not understanding that that change came by the grace of God. And sometimes, even after 10 years, they relapse. Yeah, yeah but you know, you also have to look at it as a personal relationship mm -hmm. between you and God mm -hmm. that enable us to where we have confidence that we can do this. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have to even doubt us. None of these things is solely dependent on Him who know all about us and is able to help us along the way mm -hmm. and Absolutely. keep us on that straight and narrow path. Absolutely. But then there's others that say it a different way and know the difference between sin and 
if God could have done mm-hmm. it for me. You know, they put God first. So yeah. if God could have done it, instead of saying, well, I did this, I did that. Because I live in the I did world. Hmm. Uh, the I is from the beginning between God. And he showed me the big difference with the capital letter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Big difference. And so now I hear a lot of people that say, uh, if God, he said, don't worry about it, you're going to be okay. I'm here so that to know if God can change me. Yeah. So they'll automatically give God the honor of doing that. Mm-hmm. And he guarantees what can be. But the biggest thing that gives me is people say, well, God's not finished with me yet. Yes, he is. God is finished with the old me, waiting to move forward with yeah. the new me. Mm-hmm. So that's, it makes a difference how you present the change in your life. And you can get a call to that. And again, <coughs> it comes right back to the great deceiver. Because a deceiver would put in your mind, oh, I can do it. I have done it. Not realizing that it's impossible. At some point, we're going to buckle and go down. At some point. You know, it may take 30 years, and you're right back again. As a matter of fact, there was a story on television not too long ago that this individual, he's about 40-something, and he's telling the story, and he says, I cannot believe I'm going to jail for the same thing 20 years later. He cannot believe it. But when you listen to his story, you understand how things were moving him in the direction of repeating the same story. This is what happened. 20 years before, in his 20s, he is um, sent to jail for drug possession. Now he's 40, and he has five children, one in college and the others in high school. He is making, he works with somebody and he realized, he said, I cannot live off of minimum wages. First part of the problem. He cannot live off of minimum wages. So he's gonna look now to make money in a different way. He's not going back to school to further his education. He is not looking to see what other options they have. So his immediate result was, let me do some, let me sell drugs. I'm not gonna use it. I'm gonna sell drugs. And he says that while he's selling drugs, in the back of his mind, he's thinking, when are they going to arrest me? Because he knows it's going to happen at yeah. some point. He's afraid at some point it's going to happen. And sure enough, it did happen. Yeah. He's sentenced to prison. And while he's in prison, the children now start to get affected. The one in college drops out. The two older ones in high school decide that high school is not for them. They, they need to do something. And he's seen the path that they are beginning to go. And he says the worst thing that happened to him while he's being caught is that to see the effects that is happening on his children. And I'm going to let you go. And then he, he gets released after 18 months. 18 months he spent. And the community where he lives, they are kind enough to him to give him work because he was doing remodeling houses and things like that. Yeah. So they would give him that kind of a job. So now he's back on his track, but he committed the same foolish mistake that he had done 20 years before, and worse now because he has a family that has followed his step in some way. Yeah. My brother. Well, you know, like say, uh, when I say he was like Tupac, for example, 20 years and went by that they couldn't find out who killed him. But yet when it came to our DNA, you know, it was showed up, so now they know who killed Tupac. Now the guy I thought that killed Tupac, He's in jail right now, mm-hmm. you know, it's because of the DNA testing. So that's a principle that we need to remember. Sooner or later, yeah. your sins will catch up on catch you. Up with you. Yeah. Sooner or later, we'll come to the light. Sooner or later. So that's why we need to. The sooner we turn to God yeah. and ask for the help that Christ can give us, is the better we will be off. Yeah. So why do you think Christian has to suffer in this? Christian ah. suffer in this life. A good question. Why do Christians suffer in this world? Let's even break it down simpler. Why do good people suffer in this world? And when we say good people, we include Christians. So why do good people suffer in this world? What are your thoughts? What have you discovered? Why do good, good people suffer? We <laughs> suffer to keep us in wanting and need of Christ's help. And to understand that things are going to happen and it builds our relationship to draw closer to God. Yeah. Okay. It helps to when, when I'm going through something, right. I realize that because uh, the two things here, boy, it rains with good and it rains with bad. Okay, well, that's fine too, but what does that do to me when I learn from that? It teaches me to not worry. It builds my confidence in my relationship with Christ to draw closer, knowing that 
All right, our next thought. Why, why, do, we, why do good people suffer? You know, I, I, um, I suffer every day. <laughs> um, it's to the point that where I cannot make it without him. Because other people, you know, you, you know, you got your doctors and you know, professionals, but if he's, you know, only time that I get bread from is when he provided for me. You know, I'm able to thank him every day that I'm able to get up. He allowed me another chance. I'm solely dependent on him because he is all I got. Mm -hmm. You know, and everybody else, you know, they they provide pills and all that. I, I'm not trying to put all that in him. I can't do it, but. It's bringing me closer to you mm -hmm. because I can't make it. Okay. So what I'm hearing you two gentlemen say is that we need to ask God for suffering so we can perfect our courage. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I'm saying I need to accept it because it draws me closer to who I need. Okay, so one is saying it helps me to draw, and the next one is saying I need to ask for suffering. Well, let me, let me combine both thoughts. Listen to this carefully. If you accept Jesus Christ, you will have persecution yeah, and suffering. Said that. If you don't accept Jesus Christ, you will have persecution and suffering. Yeah. Just the same. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, if you choose God's way, you're going to suffer. And if you don't choose God's way, you're going to suffer. Because in this world, Satan wants to control your life and the other person's life. And if the other person has not chosen God, then he's going to do whatever he wants with that person. And if you have chosen God, he's going to try to destroy you by creating different kind of suffering. That's one part of the answer. The second part of the answer, let's look at, um, and, and, and it's kind of a going what the brother said here, James, James chapter 1. Let me look at it here. James chapter 1. Verses 2 to 4. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. And we may not like the biblical response. We may feel that it's not what we want in this life, but it's part of God's plan. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. That's part of the response of why Christians suffer. That's part of the response. And then I've got another one, too, that I'm going to share with you in a minute. James chapter 1. What verse you said? Verses 2, 3, and 4. James chapter 1, verse starting with verse 2. He said, My brother, count it all joy when you fall into dire temptation, knowing this, that the trying let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entirely waiting for nothing. That verse 4. So what does it say here? We must count it as a joy when we have these different temptations or trials. Remember, temptation is not sin. Temptation, if it comes from the devil, is to separate you from God. If temptation comes from God, it means he's testing you to strengthen you. So there are two different sources of temptation with two different purposes in mind. One is to separate you from God. The other one is to make you grow. So we need to ask God to help us to discern which one is coming at us. Which one is coming at us? Which one is coming? Martin Luther said, and this is the same we've heard over and over, but it gives the same, and he says, you cannot prevent the birds from flying over your head, yeah. but you can prevent them from nesting on your head. <laughs> yeah. Birds will be fine, but you have a certain degree of control. If they come to nest, you can stop it. Yeah. No, it was just last week, we went to um, Walmart, and as we were about to pull out from Walmart, a couple of ravens stood in my car. And I tapped the inside of my car and nothing happened. So as I drove off, I just pressed the accelerator and stopped. And they flew away. That is an illustration that there are things that I can do to prevent the nesting 
of Satan's influences on our mind. We can ask God to remove from us. We can ask God not to help us to subdue our thoughts. As a matter of fact, he says, we should bring every thought of the imagination under subjection. So that's part of it. Temptation from God just means trials to help us to see certain things to grow. Temptation from Satan is to separate us from God. I want to say something. Like you and I discussed um, last time we were talking, how do you concern, I mean, discern the difference between your thoughts, your decisions, and God's decisions? And oftentimes I pray and say, Lord, let me see that you're helping to make a decision, not to come up with an idea or this side of the idea to come to my And it's not nothing that I, my guilt, it's not nothing to do bad, it's something to progress. No, I've decided, we've discussed this a while back, we've discussed how I want to do this, but at the moment I'm doing this now, how do I decide that these are just not my thoughts of self-progression and not God's will, because I pray and say, Lord, that God will be done, so I'm working with whatever you say you're going to do. So how can I discern the difference in the different uh, adjustments of the thoughts? Okay, so the short answer to that is, God is not going to put some thought in your mind to sin. Yeah. That's the short not, answer. Which is not a sin for thought. It's a progression of No, what I'm saying is, for example, for example, you pray, Lord, I, I don't have a job. And somebody come up to your house and say, man, I got something for you, man. What is this? It's going to make good money. What is it? You just need to de deliver this package over there. Common sense tell you that something is not right. Common sense is going to tell you something is not right. You prayed that God would give you a job, and this person come that has no credentials, this person comes to you that just wants to make a delivery, this person doesn't give you the, God is not going to give you a desire to sin. That's how we make the quick difference about it. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. It says, um, I, the question was, why Christians suffer in this world? And I think Isaiah 41, 10, give a good answer to that question. Difficulty will come, but we must know that we, we are within God's will. Okay, so let me just share with you um, Ministry of Healing, pages 470 and 471, that speaks about trials, and the trial that's coming from God. It says, to live such a life, to exert such an influence, cost at every step effort, self-sacrifice, Discipline. It is because they do not understand this that many are so easily discouraged in the Christian life. Many who sincerely consecrate their lives to God's service are surprised and disappointed to find themselves as never before confronted by obstacles and beset by trials and perplexities. They pray for childlike character for a fitness for the Lord's work, and they are placed in circumstances that seem to call forth all the evil of their nature. Faults are revealed of which they did not even suspect the existence. Like Israel of old, they question, if God's leading us, why do all these things come upon us? Let's continue. It is because God is leading them that these things come upon them. Strange, huh? Let me repeat it again. It is because God is leading them that these things come upon them. Trials and obstacles are the Lord's chosen methods of discipline and his appointed condition of success. So when we feed these things, our oppressing us, we need to ask God, God, give me the strength because there's something that I need to learn. Sometimes it is very easy to realize some defects of character. You know, whatever the thing, the person might just rub us the wrong way, mm -hmm. and we explode. And we never, had, we never did it before. But it's so happened that this person, with their personality, they just rubbed us the wrong way. And some ugly things came out of us. We thought it was never there. So we realize that there are this ugliness that needs to go. So now we're going to ask God to remove this from us. Yeah. 
because God has allowed this person to come in contact with us. He allowed this circumstance to come. Otherwise, we will never know. We just go along happy. Oh, man, praise the Lord. I'm ready for translation. I am so ready for translation. There's nothing wrong with me anymore. I've given my life to Christ, not realizing that there are some ugly things still inside there. They are lurking around. And it's only by these trials that God allows us to be tested that we can know what is still there. That's one of the main things why God allowed these trials and temptations. Because we don't realize the ugliness that we have inside of us still. Sometimes we equate knowledge with salvation. Because I know what God expects. I know about the Sabbath. I know about the state of the earth. I know I'm saved. But we forget that the knowledge is not salvation. Knowledge is just growth. Our salvation comes from Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Everything else is a bonus. Sometimes we forget that, oh, you know what? I'm an elder in the church, so I'm saved. My, 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 my position and responsibility in church does not save me. Oh, I have a master of theology, a doctor of theology, a doctor of divinity, so I'm saved. No, it's not. So sometimes we forget that by accomplishing certain things in life, that we are automatically saved. And it doesn't work that way. We are not saved by the accomplishment of things in life. We are saved only by Jesus Christ. So remember, when we see these difficult trials come to Christians, why do Christians or good people suffer? It has two purposes, remember. One purpose is that God is trying to bring out in us the things that need to be clarified, need to strengthen. The other purpose is to destroy us and to break away our confidence from God. If this thing is happening that we're being disconnected from God, then we need to pray that, God, help me to trust you. Help me to trust you. Because at some point, this is what usually happens. One or two directions. The trials come on the good person. The trials come on the Christian. And it's so overwhelming. They say, I don't want to be a Christian no more. Why bother? Because when I was out there in the world, none of this happened. Yeah. Sorry. So they walk away from God. After many years, like this guy, 20 years down the road, he went by the jail for the same reason. 20 years down the road, after we were walking with Christ, he said, no, I'm just going to just go away from it. So, remember, when these things come upon us, James says, is to fortify us. Ministry of Healing says, is to bring out the good things in us. So we need to pray and not be discouraged. Remember, Satan's method is persecution or discouragement. So if persecution does not do it for, for him, then he's going to try discouragement. So let us keep fast that God is still in control. Let's look at something else. Tuesday's lesson, speaking of persecution. And I'm just going to mention quickly, the book of Acts gives us a good description of God's early church. And the word that we use in our lingo, in our Seventh-day Adventist lingo, is the primitive church. You know, the first time I heard we need to be back like the primitive church, I was thinking, primitive church? What do you mean by primitive church? Did these people were so primitive or something? Not realizing that it actually meant something different. Primitive church in our lingo means the first Christian church. So when we talk about let's go back to the primitive church, we are saying let's go back to the first church that Christ established on earth, that we can move forward from there. So... What happened in Acts chapter 1? We find that they are in the upper room. They are waiting for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's about 120 people. Then Acts chapter 2 tells us that something marvelous happened. How many people were converted in one day? 5,000? 3,000? Somewhere around there. 5,000 people were converted in one day. And this is where we get confused many times. We say, oh man... The Holy Spirit, uh, need, we need to have the Holy Spirit and have 5,000 people converted in one day. But what we don't remember, that this result of the 5,000 people was a situation that happened over a period of at least three years. Jesus is walking on earth. He's doing miracles. He's preaching. As a matter of fact, that, uh, we, we use this phrase that Jesus did more healing than preaching. But the Bible tells us that he did all three. He preached, he healed, and he studied in the synagogue, yeah. all three. Yeah. But the emphasis in the rest of the, 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 the gospel is the healing part, what he did all three. 
So we need to do all three or two or one. Which one do we need to do? All three. Thank you. We, we don't have the healing power. Christ has to use us to heal. Christ has to use us. And he will use it whenever it's necessary. For example, speaking of healing, my wife knows about this. We had a friend in New York City. One day they came and said to us, the child is not walking. So what happened? They took the child to the pediatrician. The pediatrician could not figure out why the child was not walking. So I said, okay, let us get together, pray a few days before, then we're going to go to the hospital and anoint the child. We prayed on everything before because we didn't want to be presumptuous that we were doing it. We want to be, make sure that we were the instrument available to God's healing. And we explained to the parents and everything, and we got there, and we prayed, and we anointed the child. The following day, the child was up in the crib, up in the crib in the hospital. Doctors were just as astounding as when it happened before as when it happened after. They could not explain why the child was not walking. They could not explain why the child was walking the next day. Spirit of God tells us that the reason we are not seeing more miracles today is because people will take that as a sign and don't study the scripture anymore. So God is going to allow a minimum amount of miracles as opposed to the multiplicity of miracles that was happening before. Another thing is that people go by the thing of signs. Oh, if that's a miracle, it's going to happen. And we have seen it in our 21st, 20th and 21st century. Uh, a lot of these gospel preachers, they've come and touch the head and the person falls back. And after a while, it is discovered that all was a gimmick. 90% of those things were a gimmick as opposed to real healing. So we have to be careful when we are looking only for miracles to happen as a guide that God is present. God does miracles every day in different ways that we don't recognize. The problem is we are looking for miracles the same exact way that it happened back in the first century. And remember this, God has a thousand different ways to meet the needs of his children of which they know, know not. So when we're looking for a miracle in one way, there are 999 different ways for miracles to happen. So those are some of the things why. So going back to Acts, we find that, I think it's in Acts chapter 8. Yes, chap Acts chapter 8. But where did you find that in the Bible? What's that? God has a thousand ways to meet. No, it's, it's not in the Bible. It's in um, Carl Porter's ministry. But if you think about it in Scripture, Let's see the principle behind it where we can find it. It says, all promises in him, Jesus, all promises, so we don't know the amount of promises, the number, all promises in him are yes, true, and amen. They are confirmed, every single one of them. Some scholar, biblical scholar, took it upon himself to count <coughs> the promises in the Bible, and he came up with over 10,000 plus promises. Over 10,000 promises. So if there are 10,000 promises in the Bible, we just need to familiarize ourselves which are these promises and how to ask God to manifest themselves in the lives of our families, our friends, and neighbors. That's what we have to do. We have to familiarize ourselves. Speaking of promises, can you give me a promise off the top of your head? Just or mention where it is found. A promise. Anyone? Which one have you promised that you can think of that is there in the Bible? I will never leave you nor forsake you. That is a promise. So when we are going through the difficulties and the trials, we just have to ask God, you said you will never leave me nor forsake me. And that alone will strengthen you to go through the trial that God is putting for you and for me to grow. Another one, two more, two more, quickly. Two more promises. What does it say? The Lord is my breath and my strength. A present help. Present help. Next one. Next one. Okay. Another one said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Okay. That's a promise. That's a promise. I, I have one that goes along with it. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believed, that's the promise coming now. Whosoever. Sister James, if you believe. Pastor Johnson, if you believe. Uh, Theodore, if you believe, Eli, if you believe, Sister uh, Fraser, if you believe, Juanita, if you believe, you have everlasting life. Amen. That's a promise. You seek me, you shall find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. If you really want to find God, that's the promise. It says, if you seek me, you will find me. Yeah. 
So we just need to familiarize ourselves with the promises where they are and apply them. You want to say something? Mm-hmm. They don't match. here trying to show us that, that he's the big man and yeah. he's just using us as a pawn here to do all of this or is this an expression of his love to show me that I prefer Egypt over you mm -hmm. so all of these things are working to reveal to us who he is but even more so to reveal to us who we are yeah. and another thing that I realize in the steel is the more you rely on him and trust him and believe in him that the easy it is to accept what's going on around you in the reality. You know, like for instance, I, I sleep better. I don't have to headache like you said, I don't worry as much. And I, like I say, it's so much to be at peace. And when you ask him for to be at peace, he puts you in a situation where you have to realize how peace comes about. And so when things come about, or uh, the job, or the vehicle, or the finances, you say, you know what, Lord, I'm not gonna worry about it. I prayed about it, I give to you, whatever you're gonna do, and that's that. And you can sleep so much better knowing that it's going to be taken care of. And it makes a big difference to deal with that and, and to understand that and almost make you feel guilty to a point of how your past was that you didn't realize this. But to know it now, you know, it seems like you're almost cocky or overconfident, but it's not yourself, it's in him. I don't worry about things, and I'd be more than glad to tell others. I have a lot of young guys that I work with, and they oh, gee, what's up, this, that, and other. And they start to relate to me more, and I tell them, man, don't let nobody control your day. And they come and ask advice and questions. I say, well, and I, I give them the answer, but I say, well, Lord, give them the answer that you want me to have, because I might not say the right thing, because I'm good at that. So tell me what you want me to tell them. And if it seems like if you talk to this one, they wind up bringing another. They wind up bringing another. And before you know it, half the crew come to you to talk to you about something and ignoring the person that you think would have the answer. And it's shocking. They say, Lord, I'm not going to worry about it. When I get up, I say, Lord, I'm going to crank the car, but don't crank up. Oh, well. This is a promise to you. You're supposed to take care of this. I can't have it. Oh, well. And now my old well has become almost like cocky. I don't care. If it happens, it happens. And it feels good to have that, that, that confidence in God. Not just faith, because faith wavered. It's that confidence and trust. Okay, so let's flip the car a little bit. Go ahead. Go what flip is, my car. What, what, is, what if, by you sharing, your God-given experience, you're being persecuted. The 
Shani. And it's still off and on a bit. Uh, no longer I say good morning or good night. Uh, and sometimes you see them like standing on the corner and they're looking and talking about. And you know they're talking about mm -hmm. you. When you come close to them, they, they scatter. What does that do for you as a Christian? Go ahead. Personal yeah. experience. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There was a guy that lived next to us, no to us when we was coming up. The meanest guy on the block. <coughs> I mean, he was, he was <coughs> cursed from his porch and all of the balls that was in his yard. Nobody could come. He would not speak. Every morning I'd walk by and say good morning. They killed him. Every morning. And they would ask me, why are you speaking to him? You know he, how he is. His response or his action does not control mine. When God's love is there, mm -hmm. nothing around you aff affects That's what right. he has put in you. That's right. You affect that. Now, the consistency in mm -hmm. your life will allow them to see yeah. who God is in you. Mm -hmm. So, with that And said, by the way, I'm going to ask the question. Is it persecution or is it revelation? <laughs> persecution or revelation? Persecution means that they're coming after you physically and not just to say, hi, brother. Yeah. They're coming to hurt you. Revelation tells you God is working. The change is about to come. When? We don't know. But we are being consistent. We are not being accepted. We are being consistent. Revelation is there. So persecution, look at the form. Acts. Acts chapter 8. This is Christ church now. Acts chapter 8. We begin, we begin to see persecution happening to the primitive church. Reminding that <coughs> the primitive church means the early church of Christ. Mm -hmm. And Saul was consenting unto his death, the death of Stephen. Mm -hmm. And at the time there was a great persecution Correct. against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. So persecution created something. What was it? Separation, disbelief, fear. Separation. And they were scattered throughout Samaria, except all the apostles. Okay, it doesn't say what yet. It just says that they are, they are fleeing. Two, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and harming men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. <laughs> so even in a bad situation, something good came out of it. God's church was persecuted, but God's message went forward. That's what we've seen. Next. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Mm -hmm. So when persecution comes to Christ church, let's make it personal. When persecution comes to you, 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 and me, and we are fleeing for our lives, we are still sharing the gospel. It, it should not deter us from sharing the gospel. On the contrary, we know that they're doing the right thing. Why? Because they're persecuting us. The scripture says in Matthew chapter 5, and it sounds almost like a contradiction. Matthew 5. Yes. Why are you looking it up? It is said somewhere that the blood of the martyrs are the seed of the gospel. Yeah, that's a historical document that um, one of the, the procurers was writing to the emperor in, 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 in Rome. And it seems, it, says, it seems like every time the martyr, the, when they say martyr, when these Christians die, their blood is like seed for more to scatter, to grow. So that was a time when Christians just knew that their mission was to follow Christ. They did not think about the dangers of anything because they knew Christ had them in their hand. And Matthew 5, 10 says to us, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness. It, it doesn't sound right, but it is mm -hmm. right. And that's where we need to go to God to help us to accept this kind of a reality in our lives. Because we don't like suffering. We don't want suffering. We want to be as far as possible from suffering. But the Bible says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteous sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So with that said, we gotta close off. We're almost we have like two minutes left. Actually we have over five. And so go ahead, give me Okay, five. and I think this my opinion, because I see it happening all the time, it seems that when you're going through these trials and tests and, and situations of persecution, there's always somebody looking and waiting to see your response. Not just heaven, but people around you looking and waiting to see how you're going to respond. And if you respond a certain way, I knew it. The first day, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. Or they can't wait to persecute you more or torment you more. So it seems that it's good to stay within your realm of understanding. Stay within your protection, like that arm, that the, with the wings of that mother ain't protecting you. Because see, like every time you're going through this, you look around, there's that person. Or there's somebody come up with saying something. And like when Moses was going through this situation, there's always that one in the crowd saying, well, Moses, you did this. Or there's always somebody there to add to it, to add to the flame, to see how you're going to respond. And if you respond the way they thought you would, I knew you would, I, you know, that's the first thing they do. So you have to be prepared and ready at all times, I guess, you know. These situations mold you and make you stronger. And you could take on these darts and blades and words. And, Cause now it's like a person road rage, you look straight ahead, they say certain things, they bless their heart, you keep on going. But back in the days, you can't wait to follow them to see where they gonna stop at. Well, speaking for himself, couldn't wait to follow them. And say, remember what you said just today, you know, a couple of blocks away, now it's, don't worry about it, God got there. So, when we are persecuted, as a church or as an individual, <coughs> just remember that God is with us because he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's the first thing. Second thing, let us remember that in the persecution that we are moving, we are taking the gospel further because God wants us to, to spread the gospel. Yeah. The third thing that should come to mind, which is not always the best thing, you know, God says that if we are persecuted, we are blessed. Yeah. That, that doesn't come natural to our minds. Yes. Don't forget the far righteous saints. Mm -hmm. and Some of us are persecuted because we deserve it. Mm -hmm. We messed up. <laughs> and that's what it's our fault. Says. That's what scripture says. It's better if they persecute you for righteousness, righteousness. than for evil speaking. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you're going to go to jail, if you're going to be persecuted, if you're going to be, you know, whatever circumstance negative, make sure that it's because you are being a Christian. Not because you did something stupid. Not a practical <laughs> Christian. Yeah. So, with that said, let's um, close off with one more here. Let's see. Um, it's on Friday's lesson, the second paragraph. I think this is a good one that wraps up that it's either selfishness or is love that's going to motivate us. And that's it. That's the whole crux of the lesson. What motivates us to be a follower of God? Is it love or is it selfishness? It says, the, myst the mysterious providence which permits the righteous to suffer persecution at the hand of the wicked has been a cause of great perplexity to many who are weak in faith. Some are even ready to cast away their confidence in God because he suffers the basis of men to prosper. While the best and purest are afflicted and tormented by their cruel power. How it is at can one who is just and merciful and who is also infinite in power tolerate such injustice and oppression? Hmm. This is a question with which we have nothing to do. God has given us sufficient evidence of his love and we are not to doubt his goodness because we cannot understand the working of his providence. So <coughs> that we close off. No, we will not understand everything. We will see perplexities. We will suffer things. But the thing that is sure, God is with us. And he's not going to allow us to be tortured or suffered more than what we can handle. Okay. He knows the limit of our, of our frailties. And because he knows the limit of our frailties and he loves us, 
and say that he will always be with us. Let us take comfort that whether in persecution or in time of peace, God is with us. Amen. Thank you for your participation. Mm -hmm. We are precious that you have been with us. And um, to that link, just remain there because our divine worship continues right here. And to you that came to summer school, thank you for your presence and your participation. <coughs> Father in heaven, we thank you so much for what you have done in our lives. We thank you for strengthening our minds. You remind us that we are in the midst of the great controversy, that the war is raging for our souls. But because of your love, oh God, you have preserved us and you continue to preserve us amidst the conflict. Strengthen our trust in you. Strengthen our confidence in you. Strengthen our pursuit in finding those Bible principles and promises that will keep us to the end. Be with us now, Father, as we continue to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs>
I spent in prison helped me reconnect with God. I learned about myself and gained respect from my family. I desperately wanted to restore the relationships that I lost and get back my confidence. My family never ceased to pray. They were looking forward to my return home. We all saw how God works his miracles with individuals who share their faith with us, teaching and lending a hand in our transformation. That's what this program is all about. Locked up but never locked out of the connection with God. Join us for a weekend of inspiration and testimony. Witness the power of faith and transformation. Don't miss out. Be a part of the journey. If God says the same, we'll see you there.
just want to praise you forever and ever and ever for all you've done for me. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to thank you forever and ever and ever for all you've done for me. Blessings and glory and honor. into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp. With the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn, shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Amen. And we're praying. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just invite your presence with us, your angels to dwell in these empty pews, Lord. We just ask that you please be with us and that as the service goes on, that we give you the glory praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you all stand with me as we recite the fourth commandment, which says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thy labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy maid servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gate. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. And wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. We also have in Forest Hill, we have a vision statement, which says, The visions of the Forest Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church is to be a healthy church for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is revealed through us. Amen. There you go. Thank you, Brother Jones. Good morning. Good morning. So good to see each and every one of you out this morning. We want to welcome each and every one of you. We want to welcome our guests and our friends. Is that Mark Hale I see over there? All right. We want to welcome him and, our, and his guests. And are there any other visitors visiting with us for the first time? All right. All right, it's good. It's good to see each and every one of you. Amen. Everyone else, our, our friends of the church. I see I see uh, Sierra there and Lila Laya. Amen. I see my brother-in-law over there, uh, Matthew Green. And I see all of your smiling faces. Also, we want to see you online as well. If you're online, just put it in the chat where you're watching from. Amen. Amen. All right. At this time, I would like you guys to stand up, reach around, and just shake each other's hands. 
Go over to those visitors, welcome them. If you got some food today, invite them to dinner. Amen. Amen. Just let them know that Jesus in me loves the Jesus in you. Tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., we'll have our board meeting, 10 a.m. So if you're on the church board, if you have a, a, a ministry to leave, please be ready. We'll send out the information for the call, 10 a.m. tomorrow, 10 a.m. tomorrow. What time did I say? What's it going to be? 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. We're going to have that board meeting. On next Sabbath, on next Sabbath, there'll be a Sabbath school council meeting on next Sabbath. Sabbath School Council meeting right after service next week. Sabbath School Council meeting. Also, today at AY time, we're having a joint AY with Grace. Amen. And uh, uh, it's gonna we're going to have some fun at 6 p.m. So bring your young people out. Bring yourself out, young and young at heart. Amen. And on week after next, we're going to have this program here. You probably saw the flyers in the, in the foyer. It's titled Locked Up But Not Locked Out. Amen. Who should attend? For well, families of offenders, ex-offenders, and their families. Those interested in prison ministry. It's going to be dynamic music, good food, great testimonies, and a Holy Ghost filled preaching. We're going to be meeting at Friday night here and then Sabbath morning at 9.50 a.m. You don't want to miss it. That's in two weeks. Amen. All right. Next up, I want to bring our church clerk, Sister Rita. She has a few first readings to read. So we're going to ask her to come at this time. She'll be reading from the floor there. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I have a couple of first readings. I have Christy Brooks transferred from Forest Hill SBA Church to Grace Temple SBA Church. And then I have Elise Williams transferred from Forest Hill SBA Church to Colleen New Hope SBA Church. First reading. Thank you. Amen. Amen. We'll do the second reading and our board, our church business leader, will, will, who will announce soon. Amen. At this time, uh, we're going to continue on with our worship service. We will have our hymn, which will be led by Brother M Marcus Gately. Amen. So at this time, let us all stand as we continue on in worship service. 
Jehovah Jireh, you are more than enough for me. And I believe that you believe that that is so true. And this morning, like no other exception, it's time to praise our God. I know some of you have some heavy burdens. You have been battered back and forth. Nevertheless, you are here. To God be the glory. So those of you that would like to join me up front, you may do so, or remain where you are. You may kneel, you may stand. It's your privilege and your understanding of what God expects from us. The Bible tells us, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear them. Let us kneel where possible. Our God and our Father, here we are this morning in the 21st century. A God that knows no limit on time, but is always on time for us. Father, you are a God that is so loving, so merciful that you gave us your son Jesus Christ that whosoever shall believe on him shall have
have everlasting life. Your mercy says that if we confess our sins, you are faithful enough to forgive us, not only to forgive us, but to cleanse us. And now, Father, this morning we just want to claim the promise that where two or three are gathered together, here you are in the midst of us. Father, we have so many different burdens. Some are struggling with finances, isolation, sin problem, health, confusion, lack of discernment, and the list goes on and on. But amidst all of it, Father, you know that we are frailty and that you want to save us. We pray in a special way for every church member, whatever the circumstance may be, we pray that we will continue to grow in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we will attain the perfection that he has for us, that as he looks upon us, he will see the reflection of God himself in us. And Father, this morning, we want to continue to pray for the war zone around the world, those that we are aware of and those that we are not aware. Give our leaders, political and religious, special insight to allow your gospel to move forward. And now, Father, we pray for our specific requests that we have this morning. Sister Clark is praying for our church and pastor as we transition away to our new pastor. She's praying for healing for her sisters. Allison, Ivory, Willie, Mary Old, Beverly, and others on the list, Father. Patrick Simon is praying for his wife. She found herself in the emergency room this morning. But the good news is that she is not in dire need, but just needs medical care. And we thank you for it. Sister Harris is praying for health, family, church, and church family. Sister Bra Fraser is praying for self, family, health, and healing. Eli Williams is praying for family, friend, neighbor, and self. Gaines are praying for job, family, Chris on a job, health, strength, church family, and Pastor Bailey. Sister Hathaway is praying for her husband. You know the circumstances of the life. And now, Father, we thank you because all your promises are true, yes and amen in Jesus. So in the name of Jesus, we praise you, we glorify you, and we thank you for the blessing. And now continue to help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Let the church say amen. time, Elder Johnson is going to bring our children's story. So if you didn't pay the rent where you lived last week, you can come up. Amen. If you didn't pay the mortgage or the water bill or the light bill, you can come on down to the front. Amen. Amen. I'm just trying to see if any adults are going to pop up. <laughs> I'll also remind you, remember the AY is at Forest Hill at 6 p.m. The joint AY is at Forest Hill at 6 p.m. Be sure to bring your kids out. I'm here, here we're going to have a fun scavenger hunt with the word. Good morning, saints. Me and Julia, we got a, we got a little message for you this morning, okay? All right, how you doing? All right. Oh, there are more. There are more coming. Very good. We're going to talk this morning about God being interested in you. You believe that God knows you? Is he interested in you? He is. How have you known that? Let me tell you a story about a little boy who was taking care of his mother. There was a pharmacy that was working at night. He had worked all day long, but he spent his 
nights in the pharmacy. And just about 11 o'clock at night, he decided, I need to go to bed. And the last one had come in. And just when he was kind of cutting the lights down, another knock on the door. Mm, when somebody interrupts you from going to bed, you don't feel too well. So you're just like, OK, let me go take care of this one. And he gets up and goes and see about this one. And he gets back, and he's ready to go lay down again. And another one, ring the door, and he's knocking, coming in to get some more medication. And by this time, he's irritated. He's like, man, I'm tired. I'm sleepy. I don't need no more people to come. He goes in, and about not even 30 minutes that he is about to go to sleep and get comfortable and relax, he hears a violent knock on the door. It's like somebody trying to get in. He's like, and he gets up and he's like, mm. and he goes in and there's a little boy that's at the door. When he comes in, he says, my mother is very sick. She needs some medicine and he gives her the prescription that he has there. He looks at it and he takes it back and he's irritated, his sleepy eyes now. He's not interested in it. He's just going about doing his job without even thinking. And he goes to the shelf and he pulls out medicine and he makes it and he goes and, and give it to the little boy and tell him, get out and go and sleep in his own mind. But just as soon as the door shut, about five minutes, he recognized, I have just mixed some deadly poison in this medicine. I don't know the guy's name. I don't know where he came from. I just know the mother's name. I don't have an address. And if I could just get the address, I could run down there and stop. But he had none of that. And he now had only one thing to do that is to just fall on his knees and agonize with God. He knows that he is about to be responsible for the death of this little boy's mother. And he falls down. And as he is talking, he is now not even thinking about himself anymore. He is agonizing with God. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I need you today to hear my prayer. I need you to answer this because I don't want another person to die because of me. While he is praying and praying and praying, his prayer was interrupted by another one of those violent knocks at the door. And he gets up almost mad with himself not knowing what to do. And when he opens the door, guess who's at the door? That little boy. And to his surprise, it's like, huh? And he runs in, and he is panicking now. He says, I'm sorry. I was hurrying home, and I fell, and I broke the medicine, and I need to be can I tell you, God cares for you. In the little things, in the things when you just don't know what to do, you're out of your mind, it's out of your control, God cares for you. And he answers those prayers. When he saw this little boy, he was so elated that instead of going in to feel the medicine immediately, he just falls on his knees again. And he thanks. And the little boy is like, I'm in a hurry. My mom is sick. But you just don't know the prayers that God has answered for you. Can I tell you this morning, saints, that we believe in the hope of God. We believe that the Bible is the word of God. We believe that God is interested in every one of our problems. We believe that when you take that test and you know you done put the wrong answer down, that God has a way of fixing that thing. We knows how to handle this. 
in Mark chapter 11, verse 24. Therefore, I say unto you, these things, whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, we remind God, remind us that if we as human beings who are evil can give good gifts to our children, how much more can your heavenly father give you good gifts if you would just ask him and believe him? When you're in trouble, ask him. When things don't go right, talk to him. Believe him and he will handle your problems for you. Trust him. God is interested in you. He will pray for us today. Dear God, thank you this day. Forgive us for all our sins and shortcomings. And help us to know that you care for us. And even the little things, that the little mistakes that we make, you can still fix that. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, good morning, everyone. So glad to see you this morning. Malachi 3.6 says, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. This is God's contract to man. We're talking about being thankful for all God has done for us, and our giving should reflect just this. Uh, will the deacons come forward to take up our morning's tithe and offering? so much for all you have done, Father, and I pray that as we prepare to give, Father, we will, we will return a faithful tithe and offering, Father, just as you have determined, and this is something that will help others as well, and finish your work in Jesus' name, amen. Um, just want to remind you that there are four ways that you can give. Um, you can mail it, you can drop it by, you can have someone pick it up as well, and if you're not a member, you can do cash out as well. You know, Luke 10 says that um, that there was a nice gentleman that they called the Good Samaritan. And so back then, that's what a person was considered who stopped and did something for someone that no one else would. Today, we might call him or her a philanthropist or simply a child of God. And this is a person who allows their day to be interrupted for something that someone a person who doesn't permit uh, the inconvenience or the expense to stop them. Whatever others may say about their investment in a troubled person, it didn't matter. They gave passionately and comprehensively or completely. We ought to return a faithful tithe and offering just as compassionately. in my house. 
morning, everyone. God is excellent in your life today. Oh, I don't hear nothing. I say, is God excellent in your life today? Give him an amen. I know he's excellent in your life today because you're here today. You know, there's some folk that didn't make it today. They didn't make it this week. But God, out of his infinite mercy, cared for you enough. He gave you another week and another Sabbath. So he is excellent in your life, my friends. I want to, for those who are not familiar with me, the other turn and say they know you yet. Most of you know me. I see some new faces. I'm Elder Batiste, uh, one of the elders at Grace Temple. And so I want to thank Elder Turner and the Elder Board for inviting me this week. And this has been a, a challenging week for me. And really, today has been a challenging day. It looks like everything... You can expect happen. This morning, I teach a new beginners class at Grace Temple. So I, I kind of ended the class a little early so I can get here. On my way, I run into a funeral procession. <laughs> right smack where I need to be. So I, you know how it is with the funeral processions. You got to sit there and be patient and wait for that to happen. Then I was sitting here trying to beat the railroad tracks and beat the train. I said, I said, why am I being delayed? But the Lord brought me here safely. And I'm glad to be with you today. We're not going to be long. But we're going to come with the word of God as God has given us guidance. I want to also thank you that are here today for being here today. I know you had a big week last week, and we're happy to see you. And I want to thank the musicians for playing today. I've, he I've heard y'all online. I've heard before. These are gifted, anointed musicians that you have, along with uh, your elder board, deacons, and members of the church. Let us read the scripture right now. Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 2. Those that wish, we invite you to stand as we turn to the scripture. Say, I beseech Eudolius, I beseech Satichi, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellows help those women which labor with me in the gospel and with Clement also and others my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we ask thy blessing on the message today. As we work with the message that you have given, we ask thy Holy Spirit to fill this place, fill this congregation, fill the walls of this building with thy spirit. And then, Lord, just take a little bit of thy blessing on all of me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was 
pondering, Elder Turner, on what to speak on. Several things went through my mind. I went to my file to try to find something with the shortness of time. And I didn't know exactly what direction to go. Then the Lord put something on my heart on what Forest Hill needs this morning. And I still struggle with it. I, is this just the way I should go? Or should I go another? And then all of a sudden on YouTube, Y'all know about YouTube, don't you? I picked up something from a, a former teacher and a friend of mine on YouTube by the name of Mark Finley. You ever heard of Mark Finley? He's one of our associate presidents at the General Conference. And he was speaking to the North American Division Spring Council. And he, as I listened to him, he was addressing the same thing that's been on my mind. I said, Lord, is this confirmation? And, and as I listened to him more and more, I said, this is the direction we need to go. Not just for Forest Hill, but for all Christians as a whole. Amen? So even those that are online today, this is for us in the last days that we live in. Paul is at Philippi. Speaking and visiting with the Philadelphians, this is a church that he helped organize. Paul had a great relationship with the Philippian church. It was structured and organized as a great congregation. The Philippian church had a leadership structure of bishops and deacons. As we would say in today's term, elders and deacons in their group, it was their job to keep the church and hold the church together while Paul was away. They were to look after the spiritual, physical well-being of the congregation. And not just their congregation, but the community as well. The Philippian believers, Paul recognized them for their spiritual attitude and service to the community. The missionary work and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here in Forest Hill. This is our duty as well, to serve the people and to serve the community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Philippian church was, had an excellent reputation and character that was known near and far. When someone mentioned them, people would talk about them and say how good they were. They had a reputation let me define what a reputation is. A reputation is what others think of you, groups and organizations. That's what they think of you. That's what a reputation is. It is made up of organizations and made up of individuals. The Philippians church reflected Christ in their lives to everyone they came in contact with. That was their reputation. But more than that, that was their character. You see, a char your character is 
who you really are. The character of the church was one that just moves people in the community. They knew if they wanted to go a place for prayer, they could go to the Philippian congregation. You can go to the Philippian church. They know if there was a need in the community, someone that needed shelter, needed food, needed even a utility bill paid, they could go to the Philippian congregation. Being active in your community is a very important thing for this church. Now, now you got you got to bear with me a little bit here. I, I I've just been asked to be community service director for Grace Temple. So if I got a little community service in this message today, that's the way I'm thinking. And that is important for us. So everyone they came in contact with, they introduced Christ. They shared Christ. So the text opens saying, rejoice in the Lord. Be happy that you are a service for God to people you come in contact with. Sometimes people need you. This morning in, in the Bible class, a lady came early, and she came in there. And I asked my usual question, how's your week been? And she started going down her checklist. And she started tearing up and started crying. She said, I find no one to, to understand what I'm going through. But the same thing she went through, I went through years ago. We sat there and we had prayer. And she said, I wish the people I depended upon would pray for me in such a way. What kind of ministry are you carrying on in your community? We got to the lesson, Elder Turner. We got to the lesson, fellow elders, but then we got to the lesson after we prayed. Because what she needed at that moment was not the lesson. She needed prayer. She needed someone that had compassion on her heart for her and her son. And she was uplifted she, and felt encouraged, she said, afterwards. So we should rejoice. And the text goes on in the Lord for anything he gives us the opportunity to serve him. The text said rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. So how do you rejoice in the Lord? It could be done several ways. Some people rejoice in the Lord just by raising their hand. They're giving thanks to the Lord. They could be in church, out of church. All of a sudden, when the Spirit hit you, they just got to rejoice in the Lord. And they raise their hand. Some people rejoice in the Lord by coming and getting on the ground and putting their face to the ground and thanking God for what he has done. Or on the floor in your house, just praising him to see another day. Some people rejoice in the Lord by just sitting and patting their foot to the rhythm of the music. They could be at their, in their home and they hear a song that touched their heart and they're just sitting there. Patting. Just rejoicing in the Lord. You, some people rejoice in the Lord by just sitting quietly. In the stillness of the hour. As tears come down their cheeks, happy of the blessings that God has given them. And then some people rejoice in the Lord. And they tell me I'm kind of guilty of this. <laughs> I'm just, just sitting there with a smile on my face. And they'll add, what are you smiling about? Oh, if I could just tell you. You can rejoice in the Lord several different ways. 
our rejoicing is and should be consistent because Jesus is consistent. He is the author and infinitude of our faith. He is in our lives because we have Jesus in us. We can rejoice anytime. We can be happy anytime. We can praise God anytime. We can rejoice in the Lord. But the, the, the Philadelphia, this chapter, why it grabs me is because there are certain things going on. First, first five says, let your moderation be known to all men. Moderation. In other words, let people know who you really are. Be appropriate in your behavior to all men. Be mild and gentle. Restrain yourself. Let's talk about restrain for a moment. As Christians, we ought to be able to restrain ourselves. When that person on the job approach you the wrong way, And you feel like telling them off. And dare to say that sometimes as Christians, we want to tell them off, but we don't want to tell them off as a Christian. We want to tell them off from that old life we had. <laughs> Did I have anyone know what I'm talking about? Those vocabularies you, you thought you left go, but you, at this moment you're going back to the old chest. We got to restrain ourselves. Let our moderation be known. Let them know that you don't get upset easily. When they come to you, well, if that was me, I would have told them off. And you have to say to yourself, Lord Jesus, help me. And then tell them, I can't do that. I can't do it. You got to be like Joseph, say, I can't do this against my God. Because we represent him. And then you got to be patient. Sometimes we're not as patient as we want to be. Patience is a good thing. We need to teach our children to be patient. We need to remind our spouses and our friends that sometimes we got to be patient. As this dear sister poured out her heart this morning, Metal Floyd, I had to tell her we got to be patient. God may not come when you want to. You know the old saying. But when he come, he's right on time. He knows the beginning from the end. And if he promised it, he will keep it. Numbers 23 tells us that God is not a man that he should lie. Not the son of man. If I say it, it will come to pass. We got to remind ourselves that what God said will happen. It will come. Sometimes we want it to come a little quicker. I do too. But we got to learn patience. And so patience, we ask God to give us patience. Because he will fulfill what he promised. Psalms 89 Verse 30 say, neither will he alter the things that come out of his mouth. If God, this is God's word, this is God speaking. If he promised it to us, it will be there. The new, the new English Standard Version of the Bible translate that moderation as reasonableness. They must know that we have reasonableness in the community and in the church. I'm coming. Some, I'm going somewhere. 
This is not a call for temperance or abstinence. Some suggested that it, the ideal for generosity or the willingness to make allowance, the, the quality that keeps one always insisting on one's own full sight. It is opposite of enticement, opposition, always demanding one's due. It is patient, willingness to yield whenever yielding is not compromising to the moral principles of God's word. Reasonableness. You're able to work things out with people. The Bible says, come let us reason together. Sometimes when you are having these meetings, in board meetings, I know about board meetings, in home meetings, on job meetings, you need to be reasonable, show reasonableness. Ask God to give you patience, give you insight on how to handle the situation. Not force it to the point that in your agreeing to things, as a Christian, you cannot compromise concerning the word of God. You can't compromise. The hardest thing in the world for, is for someone to stand up and tell someone you're wrong in what you think. Especially close friends and especially family members and especially church members. That's hard. Nothing wrong with compromising, but you never compromise the principles of God's word. The principles of God's word. And I stress the word principle because we as people, what the policy says. We quick to talk about policies. Policies can change, but God's principles never change. Amen? So why did Paul make this statement? There are two sisters in the church. Euodius and Syaitichi. They were having a disagreement in the church. These sisters we could we could identify as Bible workers in the church. Because Paul let us know that they work with him. In verse 3, he reminds us. He said, I entreat ye also, true yokemen, to help these two women who labor with me in the gospel with Clemente. These two women worked with Paul in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he's telling the members of the church, you need to help these ladies. See, they need help. They worked with God, Paul in the past and sharing the gospel. But the, the point is now, these two ladies, each one felt that they knew the best way to share the message of Jesus Christ. And the best way, these ones felt they knew the best way that things should be run for the congregation. You ever met people like that? So Paul is telling the elders and the deacons, you need to help these ladies. They, they have, each one has come to the point that they would come they would say that it is my way or no way. This is the way it has to be done. It was, they would even say things, people that think like that would even say things that such, I have paid my dues, so you need to listen to me. I've heard people even at Grace Temple say in meetings, I have given all this money. So 
So you got to do what I'm suggesting. My way or no way. Paul is telling them, you need to help these ladies. He said, I entreat you and employ you as fellow yokemen to help those women. Help them. It's just these women. This could happen in other church. Any church. It don't have to be a woman. It could be a man. Folk that insist on doing things their way. They've done a lot of good. But is that God's way at that time? Paul tells them, you need to help them come together and be of the same mind in the Lord. It's not what you want to do, not what I want to do. What does the Lord wants us to do? In the book of Mind, Character, and Personality, volume 2, page 497 and 498, inspiration write that Satan delights and contention. Satan is constantly seeking to cause distrust, alienation, and malign maintenance among God's people. Why must contentment and disagreement and arguments, this must stop. The reason Paul say it must stop, why they must help them, that's found in the same Verse 5, because one thing, the Lord is at hand. We need to stop fighting in church, out of church, everywhere, because the Lord is at hand. Far as you, you are in a transition period. The leadership right now is your elders and your deacons until a new pastor come. Just like until Paul come. Paul said we can't have intention. We must let the world know that Christ is at hand. We must not let contention arise in our Christian community. Because contention arise in our Christian community, it distracts us from our mission. My subject is remember the mission. Satan will cause contention and argument to forget the mission of the church. The mission of Forest Hill is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in the Forest Hill community and then to the uttermost parts of the world, to Everman, to Fort Worth still, to Pantago, Dalworth. This is the job, Arlington. The mission of the church is to share the gospel. This church, your church, our church in Forest Hill was established to be a lighthouse in this community. Paul is saying, and it's pretty, don't let contention, arguments, and fussing come to distract. It's only a distraction. Thousands of people all over the world traveling to Texas for Monday event. Some of you were out there too. Hundreds of thousands. But how many people are there, hundreds of thousands, to be in church this weekend? How many of those people will realize that events like this is just reminding us that the Lord is at hand? That's our mission. That's my mission. When they offered me this position, I, I prayed hard on this thing. Community service director, which means I got an umbrella. I've talked to several folks, and I keep telling them my mission is to let the community know and let the church know that the Lord is God gave us a commission. 
And that commission he gave us is to make disciples of men. Each one of us here is a disciple of Christ. We ought to share the gospel. You can share the gospel any way you can. You can carry a piece of literature in your pocket. You ain't got to be a preacher. And just share it with someone. You can organize a prayer group on your job. If, if they let you do it. If they won't let you do it in the building, Sister Connie, you can step out to the parking lot. The kids had pray at meet you at the pole. High school students are starting. You can say, let's meet in the parking lot. Take five minutes and pray for each other. Then go to work. Doing that, you're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're letting them know God cares. And as a Christian, I care too. We got to do the work of God. So Paul goes on to tell them, the Lord is at hand, but be careful for nothing. Don't worry about how you're going to do it. God will show you how to do it. You can do it by inviting folk to church so they can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, don't worry about nothing, but in all things, in everything, beyond anything else, by prayer, supplication, praying earnestly, and with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. And the God that the peace of God which passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind through Jesus. So as far as he'll make this next step, pray in, through, through prayer and supplication. Call on the name of the Lord. First of all, giving thanksgiving for the pastor that just left. And thank God in advance for whoever's going to come. Give prayer. Give thanksgiving. Thank him now. And lives will be changed. First of all, your life will be changed. If there's a, if there's a grievance you have with someone, pull them aside and say, I, I'm glad. I thank you for, for being who you are. I'm going to pray for you. And when they ask you, why you thank all the trouble I've given you, why you thank me? Because you have made me a better Christian. You have made me a better person. Paul was saying, don't condemn these two sisters. These sisters love the Lord. But they want to do it their way instead of God's way. And anytime contention is there, God is not in it. He tells us to pray. And not to worry about anything. Gonna keep you much longer. But you see, the problem is we as Christians need to quit worrying over everything. We worry about everything. There's a difference being concerned about something and worry about everything. When you're concerned about something, it's on your mind, but you don't take it to bed with you. When you worry about everything, you can't sleep at night. You know? Because it's on your mind all the time. So we got to learn. We need to stop being anxious over things. The text says, be anxious for nothing. It says, be careful for nothing. Anxiety will hurt us. Let God work it out for us. Can you let God work it out for you? He used to say he will work it out. But many times we change the verse to say God will work it out if I let him work it out. I will work it out. We need to let God work out. Christians cannot live with anxiety and peace. We cannot live with rest, worry, and rest. Contention, constellation, and contentment. 
Paul said we got to have one or the other. As Paul addressed the Philippians, he had to remind them, as he reminded us, we need to learn to pray more. If you, have, if you don't have a prayer life now, you need to ask God to give you a prayer life. If you have a somehow prayer life, you ask him to give you a better prayer life. Everything is to be better. Because anxiety will hurt us and not bless us. Let me tell you what anxiety is. Anxiety is rooted in self. While prayer is dependent on God. Anxiety is the fruit of a narrow, constricted view of life. The only thing one can see is the problems and perplexities surrounding them. Prayer is the fruit of a broad, expansive view of life in which God is so big that he can handle in anything and he can overcome everything, even our worst problems and worries. God make it shrink into insignificance. Anxiety is horizontal in focus. You look at now. You, uh, you worry about this now. Prayer is vertical in focus. When we worry, we are consumed with looking to the left and to the right, to the back and to the front. When we pray, we can't help but look one way, and that is all. Anxiety never raises our eyes above our problems or our situation or circumstances. Prayer raises our eyes above and beyond ourselves to God and his power. Anxiety looks at ourselves to solve the problem. Prayer looks to endure the problem. We let God handle don't worry about anything but trust God when we are anxious our circumstances and problems control us we give and invest in them the, a power and authority to shape our lives many times we let them anxiety shape our lives when we are prayerful on our circumstances they shrink and are, are devoid of any power to shape our lives. When we pray and let God handle the problems, they don't run us. God takes care of it. We handle the problem. Anxiety is concern over the circumstances that we cannot control. You worry about, we worry about stuff we have no hand in. We can't control it. We can't control it. Prayer is confidence in the God who controls our circumstances. If God brought you through something, he will take you through it. He brought the Israelites through the Red Sea, and they did not see a way out. Egypt's army was pressing down on it. Lord, how am I going to make it? Moses said, stand still and see the power. And God worked it out for him. Prayer, well, anxiety is an expression of fear. When you have a lot of anxiety, you are fearful. I've never seen a person that had a lot of anxiety that wasn't fearful of something. But prayer is the expression of faith. Lord, I trust you. When you, when you just recently, my, my gas tank. Sister Clark, was, my, my needle was sitting between the narrow red line and the big red line. <laughs> you ever been there? And, and the person in the car said, oh, you, 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 I said, don't worry, we're going to make it to the gas station. Near the gas station I was getting to, I was trying to get that QT on Hemfield and Rosedale. You know what I'm talking about? Y'all know what I'm talking about. We, we, we're not going to make it. 
I say, well, if we don't make it, then you push me. Because <laughs> I ain't going to push. I got to steer. Are you sure we're going to make it? I said, we're going to make it. Lord going to help us make it. When we got there, the needle was hitting the top of the big red line. I said, praise the Lord. That's anxiety. I, I mean, I'm running out of gas. I ain't got no control about the gas consumption and driving the car. I got to get to the gas station. You've been in situations in your life where you're sitting between the narrow red line. And I'm not talking about cars now. I'm talking about in your life. And you sit right above the large red line. Look like there's no hope, no energy, no strength, no nothing. You don't know what you're going to do. don't know how your bill's going to get paid. How I'm going to make it. And just when you need, need it most, it comes. You know, I, I don't talk a lot about these male house blessings that come. Last month, I was sitting, and my money, my money got short. I'm trying to get to the end of the month. You know, those of us that are on fixed incomes, we live between that date and the next date. I paid all my bills. And then I get a letter from my credit card company. I opened the credit card company. Brother Cranley, there was a check in there written to me. Say, I paid them too much money. I started shouting hallelujah. <laughs> My good friend, Elder Von, I was praising the Lord on that. That was just what I needed to get me through <laughs> till my check came. That's anxiety. I didn't even have to worry about it. I just prayed about it and asked the Lord, well, we're going to do what we can. I can't control that. You say, well, you shouldn't have paid. No, no, you're going to pay your bills, saints. As Christians, we ought to pay our bills. Amen? Amen. Pay your income tax. Pay your water and light bill. We couldn't, we we shouldn't come to the church asking for financial help when we know we didn't do our part. After you do your part, the Lord will take care of the rest. If you're running short, the Lord will take care of the rest. I'm on benevolence too, <laughs> Brother Turner. I deal with money. And I always ask the person how the Lord has blessed you so far. And the church will come and make up the difference. But you got to ask God for blessings first. So don't worry about things you can't change. Don't let anxiety rule your life. Don't let faith rule your life. So when we trust God and we trust Jesus, he gives us a peace that passes all understanding. That's the peace that, he, that in times of trials you can sit there and smile. That's the peace that the early church had when they could look up and thank God that they're going to make it. That's the peace you possess when you know you've been diagnosed with cancer and it's terminal cancer. You can know that God has is with you even through that. That's a peace that passes all understanding. That's a peace when you know by some tragic accident, like I receive a text of uh, uh, your child once a month was hit by a car while coming home from school. You can still have that peace. That's the peace. That when you buried your wife and people don't understand. I had to tell the folk at Grace Temple they don't understand why I'm not crying and walking down with my head week after week at the church. Come to church smiling and everything. You see, I know what I know. I know what God's words say. So I got a peace. 
that one day I see my wife again. So I'm not sad now. I'm anxious. Now, now that's good anxious now. I'm anxious. Why am I anxious? Because that Bible says that the Lord is near. We're here at Forest Hill. We're here at Grace Temple. We're here in Fort Worth. We're here in the city of Forest Hill. We need to let folk know that the Lord coming is near. He's going to come. We must tell folk, we must not forget our mission to let folk know that the kingdom of God is at hand. So whatever you're going through, pray for Jesus coming. Pray that you are ready for his coming. Pray that you touch somebody and cause them to pause in their life and think about Jesus. Because you, he is coming soon. And so as we trust in God, contention, strife, arguments in the church will cease to exist. As we continue trusting God, people will know we are Christian. Not just because we got signs saying we are a church, but we will know, the Bible said, by our love for one another. They will know we are Christians. That when someone is hurting, we will try to help them. If not, we can't help them physically or not, we can refer them to where they can get help. There are contacts, you know, where you can send people for help. But the thing is, Paul was telling Philippians Church, don't lose sight of your mission. Don't lose sight of why you exist. Forest Hill, let us not lose sight. Let us remember our mission. Baptiste for that word. At this time, how many of you guys are struggling with sharing the gospel? How many of you guys are weary right now? How many of you are weary warts? How many of you worried in your life? How many of you worried about something this week? Let's all stand at this time. If you're worried, if you didn't worry this week, that's all right. But if you're worried, well, if you worry all the time, let us stand. You know, you know, he kept saying prayer and supplication. Prayer and supplication. I want you, when you get home, you can do it now too if you want to. Type the word supplication in your notes. And then press and hold on that word supplication. And you'll see it pop up with a definition for supplication. It means to pray earnestly, almost begging for something to happen. That's what supplication means. We need to pray earnestly, almost begging for the Lord. And it's okay to beg to the Lord for him to show you what it is your mission. What is your mission? Some of us know what our mission is. Some of us don't know what our mission is. And we're going to pray right now that the Lord will show us the way. Show us our mission. Show us what it is he would have us to do. Some people don't know. Even if you know, sometimes you don't know how to bring it about. So let us pray at this time. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for Brother Baptiste bringing us, uh, Father, a word to remind us of our mission, Father. Lord, help us not to worry about anything, have any anxiety. Let us put our trust in you, in everything, Father. Our spiritual growth, our finances, Father, where that's a struggle for a lot of us, Father put you first our relationships father our health father lord help us rearing our children father lord what mission do you have what ministry do you want us to be a part of father lord help us to share the gospel starting in our homes our neighbors our families distant relatives 
our co-workers, Father, even the person in line behind us or in front of us at the store. We just ask, Father, you would show us how. Give us opportunities to witness and be a mission. And Father, most importantly, Father, may we have the love of God in our hearts. May we share it and show it amongst ourselves, Father. May we do as you prayed in John 17. Have that love one for another, Father. Lord, just like our lesson said this morning, is it love or is it selfishness? Let us show that love. And when we share that mission, Father, may we, may we show forth the God in us, Father, because they don't care what we, what we know unless we show what we care, how we care. So, Father, be with us, Father, we pray. Keep us, Father. And indeed, let us, you be the center of our joy, Father, we pray. We ask this all in Jesus' name. When I've lost my direction, you're the compass for my way. You're the fire in the night when nights are long and cold. Yes, the laughter of the children, my family and my home. You're the finish, you're the start of my highest dream. Oh, Jesus, you're the center of parking lot. Pretend there's a sign there that says, you are now entering the mission field. Not about what you do in here. What you gonna do when you leave this parking lot? Let us pray in benediction. Now to him that is able to keep you from falling. To present you faultless before the presence of this Lord with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. Let the Mission-driven saints say, amen, amen, amen. Man, you may be seated as the usher ushers us out. I can thank you online for joining us. We look forward to seeing you on next week as well. And remember, bring your young people back for AY at 6 p.m.